recorder, so we've got this captured. This is Rex's uh, alumni reunion meeting for January of 2022, as we begin the new year in the middle of the pandemic, the never ending pandemic. We see the uh, head of the C CDC saying this morning that uh, uh, everyone is likely to get Omicron at some point. I miss the CDC saying that, but it makes like, ah, uh, great. So much the sense. CDC is one of the various. Mr. Parker, so nice to see you. With the warm fire behind you. Ooh. Yep, I'm gonna apologize immediately because I, I can actually only stay for half an hour, but I did want to drop in and just say, Happy New Year and say hi and let you know I still exist. <laughs> every, every minute of your presence is precious. So thank you for joining us. Um, so Omicron is just going to like touch everybody? Yeah, that's, that's what they're saying. Well, I'll, you know, although someone pointed out there's an important distinction between saying everyone will be exposed to Omicron and everyone will get Omicron. You say everyone will be exposed, that means you can still wear a mask, you can socially distance, you can do your rapid tests, which are probably the single most important thing that you could be doing. Uh, but if you the, say uh, everyone's going to get it, then that's kind of saying, oh, fuck. You know? Here's the headline from the Post. Omicron will infect, quote, just about everybody, Fauci says. Mm -hmm. oh. oh, is that it's Fauci? Just, that's yeah. Fauci, as it turns out. I thought it was somebody else, but it was Fauci. Yeah, I thought so, too. Huh. Uh, did you all next? see... Did you all see Fauci um, coming back at Rand Paul? Mm -hmm. That was priceless, actually. Is that the what a moron comment? No, that was somebody else. I mean, that was somebody else. Somebody else, yeah. This is, this is Fauci, who's in a congressional hall somewhere. I don't know what, but Rand Paul is sitting up at the dais with his name in front of him, and Fauci holds up a printout of Rand Paul's fundraiser site for his campaign. And he's like, fire Fauci, and he's got donate here next to it. And Fauci sitting there is like, basically saying what the fuck without the fuck but but like really like what what do you think you're doing raising funds off this it's um yeah, well he's saying say, i say if you're going to run fun, you know funding off my name where's my cut or that or that <laughs> he, he actually should have said you know i'll take 50 percent of that or i'm going to sue yeah. you for a license infringement that's right well you know he's receiving debt literal death threats and yeah has been for a long time Mm -hmm. Well, they made him the, the punch dummy of, of anti-vaxxing. So, you know, uh, he had the, well, the that, bad luck of being the, the, spear, the spearhead of the campaign to try to convince people to well, It's a big licensing opportunity. You could have Fauci plush dolls, you know, for the people who love him. And you could Little have pinatas and, you know, voodoo dolls for the people voodoo who don't dolls. like him. It's great licensing, you know. So Fauci there's a such a big brand. The, um, so when my mom was in decline, one of her friends bought her a, a doll that's made for like whacking on things. It's a frustration doll of some sort. I'm forgetting what it is, but it's a really hardy doll that looks a little bit like a straw man, mm -hmm. kind of long. Mm -hmm. And uh, you could you could do whatever you wanted with that doll. It's great. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. So, so uh, Mika, I have a really yeah. short term, short term interest in politics, which is filibuster and voting rights. Uh, uh, like apparently the 17th is an important deadline for taking yeah. action on, on both. And I have this sinking feeling that it won't happen. And I have this sinking yeah, feeling for, that- For midterms. That, that mid yeah, but, but, but I have a sinking feeling that that deadline is a really important kind of milestone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, my reading is uh, this is, you know, like the groups have been demanding this for a while. It's been really, really hard to get Biden and Harris to put the issue front and center. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think, look, they're afraid they're going to lose. And so they've behaved as if they're going to lose. Mm -hmm. um, and at the, la you know, what is it, the 11th hour? Now they're, you know, kind of marshalling the their ability to focus attention to try and make it one of those votes that Mansion and Cinema, you know, ultimately decide they can't be on the wrong side of. But I look I, from the very beginning of the year. I thought this was last year. 
I thought the whole strategy around voting rights was upside down. That, you know, they had this giant omnibus bill, the For the People Act, which was like every politics reformer's wet dream. It was written mostly by Fred Wertheimer, who's been with Common Cause since the 1970s and who's been behind the scenes, one of the few key people, you know, tracking and, and writing the major legislation around campaign finance laws. Um, and some, some group of people decided it was a good idea to, you know, just put everything in one bill and then, you know, and then that way we'll, all the groups will, you know, marshal their forces together and we'll get it over the top. Well, when you do that, you also get everybody confused about what's most important and, and, you know, the messaging got blurry. It never, and I never thought there was any chance. And then in, in September, I think it was Manchin said, you know, why don't we just do these things? And, and they came out with what's now uh, a stripped down, but still pretty good bill. Mm -hmm. But we could have done that back in February, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, the all eggs, one big basket thing was hard, was weird. It was, well, no, it was because the process issues generally have been the province of a you know, relatively elite group of insiders um, at a handful of organizations. Um, and, you know, it's just sort of been delegated. And so it, I don't think there was any evaluation at any point that said, well, is this really what we need? Even the election administrators, people may not remember this, but when the first big bill came out, uh, I forget who it was, Jessica Hoosman, who writes for ProPublica, I think, did a piece where she interviewed local election administrators who were like, there are things in this bill that are gonna make it harder for us to uh, get ready for 2022. You know, this isn't what we need. Many of the things in here aren't feasible. We don't have enough time. We don't have enough money. It, it was just so time lost. Then we get to September and, you know, everything else is jammed. You know, we have a system that seems to work on one thing at a time at best. Right, right. right. That's, which is weird. And the only yeah. the only gate that I saw was kind of interesting and important and realistic was the reconciliation format that only allows one reconciliation to happen per, I guess, congressional term? No, they not, can not terms. Two, a year, Session. two a year. Two a year. And that's okay. just this parliamentary <laughs> bullshit stuff that they yeah. all agree to follow. But it's but it's how you squeak things through without a super majority, without a without cloture, right? Without firing the Senate parliamentarian and hiring one that works for you. Yeah. I mean that's what the Republicans would do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, and, and it's funny because the Republicans like are, this is like a knife fight in an elevator and the Republicans have like five knives and the Democrats are in there like with their gloves on going, oh, with a spoon. Wait, wait. What, with a spoon, yeah. Like, no, no, I, I put it this way. It's a night, they came to a knife fight with a law journal. Um, and, you know, they're, they're, if it's thick enough, you can avoid being stabbed, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Over the head if it's a, right. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So ahead, Kevin. right. Sorry. So next week is I, I actually thought I had a conflict today because there is a call at three o'clock uh, that Schumer is going to be on um, that a bunch of the voting rights groups are all, you know, using as a messaging, you know, like, well, let's get all our ducks together. And, and I was planning to get on that. And I just realized it was 12 p.m. Pacific time. Um, so here I am. Awesome. Uh, I'll report back in my newsletter or somewhere if anything interesting was said. But I, I do feel like, you know, when the major voting groups in Atlanta, in Georgia, decide to boycott uh, Biden's speech because they're tired of speeches, right? They're sending a sort of last ditch signal. This is I weird. Uh, by the way, if everybody is not subscribed to Mika's newsletter, here's the link. Please go subscribe. Thank you, Jerry. I mean, seriously, it's really, it's really awesome. Um, but but, but I, refuse, I refuse to uh, uh, let despair uh, guide me. <laughs> good. And good. look, I mean, we live in a we live in a federal system, 
right? So, I mean, yes, Congress has a tremendous amount of power and money to, to wield, but you know, when things go bad, we still live in 50 states where a lot of variety, you know, both good and bad can happen. And I think people forget that. Mm -hmm. uh, Kevin, you were going to jump in a moment ago. I think that the comment I was going to make glibly was uh, that Keanu Reeves has a good move with a book, right? You know, where he you know jams the book in your Adam's apple, all right? So it, it, that law book could come in handy, all right? Is that in, in uh, the, the John uh, Wick movies? It was in the John Wait, Wick movies, yeah. Actually, it was in his Jimmy Kimmel interview. <laughs> nice, nice. See, we can source all this stuff. We can source all this stuff. One of the, one of the things that I've learned by practicing a martial art is that uh, face to face with somebody who knew their knew their stuff, I would be dead within seconds, regard, regardless whatever training I've got, whatever else. Somebody's somebody's a couple levels above you. You are just a dead person mm -hmm. um, because it's it's possible to do things so quickly and so aggressively that you're probably not gonna not gonna. I said Krav Maga, and I said no. I watched Quick Straw Maga. Yeah, <laughs> Quick Quick Krav Maga. I don't know. I'll do the thinning around here. There you go. Uh, two, two more just small political things. One is I was reading something that was a little bit too glowy about Nancy Pelosi, but how she's like this deep strategist and, and like a lot of Democrats really respect her because she's worked the background thing hard and long and understands where the skeletons are buried and what to do. And right. the second thing is that Biden spent 31 years in the Senate. Like, like um, mm. he knows these people in the room. Where's his LBJ moment? Like, where? Like, I think he's he's I think he's trying to do that. And the, and the the first anniversary of January sixth speech was a little bit of that. But I don't I don't see Biden actually using any Biden mojo here yet. Well, his all of his expertise harkens back to an earlier Senate that he was part of. All right, and he's been out of the Senate for a while, all right? So yeah. he has colleagues. He doesn't have contemporary knowledge of the dynamics of what's he's, going on in there. He, he's been standing nearby, like at the 50 exactly. yard line for the whole time. So it's not like he's, it's not like he was away in, in China for that long. 100%. He's seen yeah, what but, happened, but he's not on the ground. In fairness, seven Republicans voted to impeach Trump the second time. Yeah. And I forget what the number was, 13 or, some in the middle teens number voted for the first infrastructure mm -hmm. bill, the, the one that they passed, you know, in November. So, you know, on his side, he's like, well, a lot of these people still want to make deals. You know, and those deals are, it's far, far better to pass a law than to do something through executive order, mm -hmm. because those can mm -hmm. be immediately reversed by the next mm -hmm. administration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, second thing I want to put in was uh, last night I read, I thought I reread, but it felt brand new and fresh, uh, this piece. Uh, so Braver Angels has a format they call Braver Angels Debates, which, was, which were created uh, by April. I'm forgetting her last name. I've got it in here. Um, but uh, it's a lovely format for bringing blue and red people together in a sort of safe, respectful space and, and having conversations that make a difference. And, and it felt like there was a lot of wisdom in the piece. For example, she, you know, she says, uh, all comments are addressed to the chair, not to the person who just spoke, blah, blah, blah. There's a couple things to make the process better, but also that as the chair, she makes a point not to correct things. So when somebody says redneck, she doesn't say rural American and correct them. She's like, that automatically like makes it a non-safe space for red people. And I'm, I'm sort of over commenting on, on her write-up. But partly partly reading that piece made me think that what I'm doing in OGM and stuff like that feels a little amateur hour because we're very much alike in the group. We're mostly, mostly left-leaning. Um, and we need to figure out how actually to sort of sit down and, and figure out how to collaborate with people who think differently. And, and this seems like a fruitful process. And I don't know if you have any opinions on Braver Angels or if there's anything about, if, if there's any awareness on the left that this might be a really fruitful way to, to bridge that divide, because I really think that the divide needs to be bridged, not deepened. The, the, I, <clears throat> I, do some pe I do see some people struggling 
to figure out how they can move past uh, a type of political organizing that seeks to win by bludgeoning the other side into defeat because those victories don't seem to be very stable. In other words, they're recognizing that uh, it, you just fuel a backlash and the backlash in many ways is stronger <laughs> because you know it's easier to organize the white nationalist Christian minority because it's homogenous than it is to sort of bring together a much more diverse rainbow, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And, but how that then turns into something else, the, the only thing at the moment that, you know, and it's a total long shot. And I wrote a piece about this uh, two months ago when I heard about this, there is an effort underway to convince uh, senators like Murkowski and Manchin that uh, what America needs is a centrist third party. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that the way to uh, break this polarization cycle is by Congress passing a law that says that smaller parties if, uh, nominating candidates for Congress can cross endorse. It's called fusion. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a system that we still have in New York, but it used to be how we did elections all through the 1800s. Um, and it partly worked because parties printed their own ballots. We didn't have the uniform state ballot that we have now, which is called the Australian ballot because the secret ballot comes from Australia. Um, and so what you had was something good and something bad combined. The parties would print their own ballots. And so a smaller party could support the candidate of a larger party, but their votes would be counted on the smaller party's line. So you could see the influence of the Liberty Union Party or the, the Mugwumps or whatever, you know, the, the, the know-nothings. Um, and this actually was quite a fruitful system. And the Democrats and the Republicans in the 1890s separately realized that this, by banning it, they would kill the populists, which is what they did. <laughs> and then we got the artificial monopoly duopoly that we have now. Um, you give people back the ability to fuse and then you can have a Lincoln party, which is to give the sort of non-Trump Republicans and independents a way to vote for Democrats without having to vote Democratic or register Democratic. Right. right, right. Um, and it would strengthen, it would absolutely strengthen the center left against the right, which is the thing we have to do if we're going to survive the next few years. Also, if there were a small breakaway uh, conservative party, they would hold the swing vote. They would be really there, powerful. There won't be. There won't be. It's not sustainable. Small well, parties not? in American politics are unsustainable. They don't win anything. You know, first past the post just really screws us up. We had proportional, um, proportional um, ranked voting. We'd be in a lot better shape. That's yeah. the other potential solution. The problem with ranked choice voting as we experienced it here in New York recently is that you get too many candidates and the public is incredibly confused. Mm -hmm. It's the tyranny so, of choice then. There's a, there's a different problem, which is you just, everything gets factionalized even more. So it's a solution, but we, you know, maybe we need a higher threshold for who even gets to be a candidate in those systems. But the, the, the fusion solution has the merit of giving all the people who are now never Trumpers, you know, Bill Crystal and his whole crowd, a place to go politically. The money is already there, but they don't have a, a, a feasible elect, electoral vehicle. If you created a center third party now, all you would do is split 
the opposition to more Trumpies. So and we can't afford that. Yeah. Um, Mike, before you have to, to boogie, um, any thoughts on this? Or would you like to put a different um, thought in the conversation? Gonna, I was just actually going to put in the comments um, after saying that we're watching from concern, with concern. Hmm. We're watching with concern because I, as I think as far as, well, as far as I'm concerned, and most of the people I talk to, I, I respect the opinions and views of here. Um, we see the upcoming midterms, the next election, as being absolutely crucial globally, okay? Yeah. Because the gangsters, and there is no other description for them, the gangsters we currently have in power here <clears throat> will draw huge, huge energy from anything which goes further right in the States, mm -hmm. right? And... Um, and don't be in any doubt, do, do not be in any doubt whatsoever that what we're seeing is absolutely a global movement. These guys are networked globally. Yep. So interestingly, Latin America is having a second pink tide. Like really interestingly, it's, there's all sorts of backlash and the woman who took over from Ollanta Humanta in Bolivia got put in prison. Uh, for violating human rights. And there was like, like a different election there. So things are happening in Latin America, which I would not have expected because I was, I was like, oh my God, Latin America is sunk. And, and, oh, and Lula, some, Lula is actually running groceries. again and way ahead of, of, of Bolsonaro and Brazil for the next election cycle. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, there are some grassroots things happening here as well. So even in little, what, little old Wales actually is a separate country. It does have its own assembly. There is now a much stronger than, than there has ever been there is a stronger move for independence for Wales, in which case it has, and the government has already aligned itself with Iceland, New Zealand, uh, with the a commitment to well-being economy and stuff like that. So looking at radical reassessment of what it means to have an economy and, what, and who it should benefit. And from my amateur perch uh, way outside the UK, I think that a lot of Scots might have voted for Brexit because it was a really nice opening to leave the UK and rejoin the EU, et cetera, et cetera. Might, might the UK actually sort of dissolve in the next decade? Oh, and there's a real, really strong chance it will. Hey, I tell you what my, my dream scenario is. Yes, please. For Wales, Wales to go independent, Scotland to go independent, Northern Ireland to be reunified with Southern Ireland, and then we can create uh, a, a democratic alliance all members of the eu the celtic the celtic union Ooh, the celtic union mm. wait are but scots aren't celts or wait are they is, is yeah, everybody in the center same, for celts same sort of same sort of fundamental root same root okay hey Breton like, might join too who <laughs> hey Breton. <laughs> yeah there you Full go. Of celts. <laughs> and england can england can do its kind of like ultimate sort of um exceptionalists Thing. dream of post empire for as long as it wants i like that i mean that, that that's an interesting interesting idea uh, that might dissolve that way only it would it, it felt as painless to imagine the dissolution of the united states in some similar way yeah yeah it wouldn't pain me uh, I mean, no, no. I, mean the US, I, I, I mean, the UK, I, it wouldn't pain me to see it. Disappear yeah, and I think that in, in you know, the, it, there's such uh, gnashing of teeth when you suggest that maybe the United States should break in two. But, you know, if we could think of some four, you want to break it into four, Jerry? Four or five, sure. So, so who is the Gorbachev? Get more votes in the, the UN States. that way? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, hey, guys, I've got to run. It's been uh, great. Really yeah, good. thanks, Mike. I'd love to see you a longer, you know, for a longer time next time, I hope. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Which four, Jerry? Um, so there's several different books and works on on the five tribes of America or whatever, and I, I I don't have a strong feeling about this, but but it feels to me like there's more than two divisions going on here, uh, and and you could have some really interesting multi you know sort of so one of the things that would happen I think is that the U.S. would stop being a superpower. Because these these, these happen to a nicer bunch of people. Bingo. 
bingo. And, and it's like these, these different nations couldn't agree on a defense strategy. They would each have an army, each blah, 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 blah. And then they'd kind of be in conflict with each other now and then. And they'd sort of neutralize themselves. And it would be a good thing for the world to not have America be like the big swing in superpower. So China uh, would be the only superpower? And China's on the ascent, but China's kind of, I, I just don't understand whether China is the juggernaut that's going to eat everything or like seriously in trouble and about to spin apart itself. I can't figure that one out. Um, okay, no, just because, those. just just because there's evidence on both sides, like lots of evidence on both sides, right? Yeah, for China to go global would be new. It's been always been a regional power, right? Which is very and different. they've never, and they've really never tried to go invade and take over everybody. Ask Vietnam that. Um, well, na neighbors, 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 sort of, yeah. So, so the, the Vietnamese have successfully held off China for a thousand years, uh, or maybe more. Um, I don't know. And certainly China wants back Taiwan, Hong Kong, all that kind of stuff. They're like, there's no doubt about that. And they're certainly absorbing Tibet and, and all of that, granted. But I don't see China wanting to take over Russia, for example, which would be like, wow, you could, you could be the largest country by 4x or something, right? To go back to the point made earlier about the International Association of Gangsters, um, <laughs> You know, if that's what we really should worry about, countries that have rule of law versus countries that have rule of men, then breaking up the United States feels like it might be worse for that. I, I kind of agree, unless the U.S. is on the wrong side of that battle. Let's pretend Trump wins re-election or, or, or a further to the right than Trump person. You know, uh, let's, let's pretend Madison Cawthorn is the 48th president yeah. of the United yeah. States. Yeah. Let him be in charge of the, the Confederacy. Yeah. 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 And then there's, then there's a global Confederacy, right? Yeah. And Steve, Steve Bannon is the Secretary of Defense or the, or the Secretary of State of that. And then, then like large hosage proceeds through across the world. I just I, I, I just want you to know that if, if you take the you know uh, laws versus men to its logical conclusion, you don't need a population because you can just embody the laws as their own system and you don't need a population to have a country. So so I could say more. You're not saying we should re reconstitute the U.S. as a DAO. I don't think that's what you just said. No, I, <laughs> no, I'm just saying that the, um, you know, the, the, it, we, we invoke so blithely the, the laws instead of men, all right? It, it's the, it has to be you know, laws and or laws for, right, people, right? Because, you know, like a corporation, being instantiated as a person that at some point you just say look all right it's all about the laws it has nothing to do with all right the people that they serve you could yes. you could be going down the road of the laws becoming the system and ignoring you know the original you know group that it was that they were meant to serve right so i'm just i'm just pointing out I wrote you a scenario load it up into ago. ai and just say look this is this is the United States now, all right? And, you know, has nothing to do with the people who live there. About so the, the, no, go sorry, go on. I thought you were finished, I'm sorry. Go okay, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just do this real quick and then go to you. Um, so there's a thought that's been in my brain for a long time. We are involuntarily rene renegotiating the social contract around the world. Um, and then, we, you know, lots of protest movements. There's uh, the Tiananmen protests, the Umbrella Movement, Trumpism, Occupy Wall Street, the Gilets Jaunes, Extinction Rebellion, Black Lives Matter, Never Again, Arab Spring, the Cacerolazos in Spain. Um, all of these are basically people really pissed off that the social contract is broken. And so it feels like we're in a small window, maybe three decades, of extreme plasticity around the world where things could get rearranged very dramatically kind of like we're jokingly talking about yes um, a lot of a lot of big things could be different in 30 years i, I i'm like the, the current arrangement of of transnational governance da, 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 uh, money how money works who owns the money you know the dollar as the as sort of the king currency all that all that kind of stuff feels to me like it's in transit right now and we don't quite know 
you know, of course we don't know how it ends up, but, but for me, like Chile, a small point on the, the, the second pink tide in, in Latin America, uh, the election of the, the young guy in Chile is partly to ratify a new constitution that the Chileans wrote because the old one was written under Pinochet and is a and, shit constitution. And it includes climate change as part of it. Yeah, bingo. And a, and a bunch of other really interesting progressive ideas in the new constitution, which, which you know, 40% of Chileans are going to absolutely despise. So, you know, the fact is, you know, like the, you were just talking about, you know, that money's in transition or, you know, currency is in transition. Well, the fact is, you know, in a lot of places, money is more important than the preceding reason that we have money, which is exchanging value. How do we do that, All right? And, you know, the, if, if you look at, well, money's important. Well, money's only important to the degree that it allows you to do value exchange. Right? When it stops doing that and becomes an end to, uh, to itself, right, it starts to suck a lot of um, capacity out of the system. And by the way, tomorrow at 8 a.m. Pacific, we're having a call about money. Like what is money and what is value and what role does it play for right. OGM? So if yeah. you're interested, join us. Yeah. Uh, same Zoom as this tomorrow at uh, 8 a.m. Pacific. Um, and it's going to be run by, hosted by Grace Rahmani, who's a really good and interesting thinker who's, you know, not in the same political spot as I am, for sure. I mean, that's one of the things that's pretty good about this group is that it has a tendency from time to time to go upstream from, you know, something that, you know, is, is this, the current described problem, right, to something that's more thoughtful, right, that is a better question. I get really annoyed at people who are enthralled with blockchain, not realizing that it's a subset of, you know, um, digital ledger technologies, all right? And, you know, that, you know, your blockchain has become a cult, <laughs> right? <laughs> what, yeah. uh, on that subject, I mean, both Paul Krugman's column from two days ago, noticing all the blockchain mania, Bitcoin mania among yeah. uh, right wingers, um, and uh, the idea that there's a project here to undermine trust in uh, the old currencies, and that movements that undermine trust that that this there's a tie here to fascism that you know when you explode people's trust in what seemed to be the order of things, um, you open them up to more radical movements. Um, obviously the hyperinflation in Germany wasn't uh, engineered um, in the same way, though obviously the folks who imposed the Treaty of Versailles on Germany didn't know what that was gonna do. But uh, Dave Troy, who uh, some folks may remember uh, has been writing interestingly about this. I don't completely buy everything he says, but he's predicting that when the whole Bitcoin bubble collapses, it will fuel a wave of disenchanted believers um, who will, this, this will be a, a recruiting opportunity for the Bannons. So the melting of cryptocurrencies uh, which some predict would then lead to a surge on the far right and populism because these people would be pissed and broke. Right. Yeah. But of course, you know, cryptocurrency will persist because we made bear bonds illegal. And this is the, you know, the dark currency that's necessary for criminal activity. Right. So it's not going to necessarily go away, but is it for you? Right. Will it go away as an investment? Yeah. Well, that, that it probably should is, it's kind of like you know, describing hydrogen as a fuel. It's not a fuel. It's a carrier of energy. It doesn't have any you know, properties that actually function as fuel, but it carries energy from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. So it needs to stop behaving like a, an investment. And if it actually did function as a currency, right? You know, just transfer of value. Okay, you know. But the speculative thing is, is killing it, right? It yeah. makes it a Ponzi scheme. 
the curse may you live in interesting Shall we talk times. about NFTs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that too. What the heck? We're right next door. We're, we're standing in the hall eating canapes. Might as well enter the NFT room. <laughs> I own an NFT. I, I, own, I bought one for the Brooklyn Bridge. Oh, nice. <laughs> I've got some land in Florida that I should NFT. Yes, NFTs actually, when you boil it down, are great as a form of um, digital signature. I can guarantee that this baseball card has Yogi Berra's signature, so it's worth a lot of money. I can guarantee that this piece of digital art has the digital artist's signature. You can have multiple copies of it, just like you have multiple copies of the Yogi Berra uh, baseball card. But if it has the signature attached to it, yeah. then it's actually, yeah. you can prove that it has value. Yeah, so all so the companies that, are, that, that do kind of those business. electronic contracts you know, should be the ones who are jumping into this space to legitimize it, as opposed to it looking like the Wild West, right? But, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's really silly what they're doing with it, but the underlying <laughs> technology has a very narrow, but, mm -hmm. you know, important value. But mm -hmm. it's just turned into apes eating apes. Um, so quick round robin on a one to five, uh, <laughs> One being NFTs are completely ridiculous and in fact dangerous. Five being there's a pony here somewhere. Uh, hold up your hand depending on what the number is. Pi. One, 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 two, one, three. Cool. And and I did four because I think that like most of the stuff that's happening around them are sort of ridiculous, but it like there's a certain take on NFTs, a piece of which Jamey just talked about that I really, really like that solve a bunch of problems in interesting ways. Yeah. There's um, the air gap problem. I mean, that, that, that's, that's the fundamental mm. flaw in NFTs. If it's entirely digital, if it's on that blockchain, and if the sociology and the institution behind the software continues, then you're in like Flint. Other than that, though, you mean if the infrastructure melts, then the existence of the NFT goes away? Yeah, but, but even, even, even before that, the connection between the NFT and whatever it is, you're trying, like, Jamais, you said attaching the NFT to something. You can't do that unless the, unless the something is purely digital and it's inside the NFT. Well, I was thinking that it would, it would be a way of signing digital art. Yeah, we have lawyers for that. We have lawyers for that. Yeah, but that doesn't really, that doesn't, like one of the things that I love about NFTs is, you know, Beeple's thing goes for 66 million. And, and I have one of my alternate Zoom backgrounds is exactly that piece of art. And, uh, you know, that's really kind of cool that somebody, that somebody, somebody thought the claim on I'm backing this thing and I'm putting words in their mouth, obviously, but somebody thought that that claim was was worth 66 million bucks and probably they can flip it for more but i can own exactly the same work and that is fine because abundance because bits right now i have this little fiction in my head that in open global mind as we're trying to build like a, a global collective memory or brain or something like that um, that somebody might want to buy an nft that was a snapshot of this nascent fledgling little collaborative brain and that those might actually be of value because randomly created art as an NFT makes no sense to me. I don't like yeah. them. They're not pretty, don't care. Um, they're, 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 they're interesting as artifacts, right? And then somebody buying an NFT of, of, of Jack's first tweet, I, I can totally see how somebody would do that. That makes, that, that is an historic, virtual historic artifact that, you know, could, could pass on. And as long as it's not replicated a thousand times and resold a thousand times, uh, you know, if, if, if Jack doesn't go in and say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to do that again. And suddenly like all bets are off because then we've decoupled the uniqueness of it. Anyway. I mean, I, as, as an early, you know, participant in something that's similar, it wasn't called an NFT at the time, but I owned virtual real estate at IBM in an alumni island and pavilion that was built by some of my team members. Uh, you know, what's the punchline? It was built in Second Life, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, the, you know, the Second Life, you know, parallel universe collapses, right? And so, you know, was it worth something? Was it worthless, right? Um, 
you know, it certainly wasn't a lasting investment, mm -hmm. right? But we actually did spend money on architecture, right? For to sure. make the thing look good, right? With real architects, the, right? The and, AP had a reporter for a while who was supposed to cover what was going on inside Second Life. They had a bureau. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So at any rate, you know, th this entire phenomenon has, you know, echoes of, you know, are you building, you know, in a space that is going to have permanent value? Don't know. No, never. You can't even do that you in the physical know. world. You can't even do that in the physical world. You build yeah, on the coastline, nothing. it has a lot of value. In 25 years, that's gone and you have no one to sell it to. Sorry, Tucker. Um, you see here about Tucker Carlson saying, well, people who, who, we don't need to have insurance for people who are on the coastline. They can just sell their houses if, if the uh, ocean rises. Good luck on that. What's well, it's, it's kind of like those thin, you know, condos on 57th Street in and around. It's kind of like uh, I wonder what the long term value is of those really narrow, you know, uh, toothpicks in the sky. I don't know. But you know, the point is that, that you know, even physical stuff has has an end date. Just we are <laughs> right. You know, so. Uh -huh. Is, is our sell by date running out? Um, not this group. And, no, and just, not a chance. Just to show everybody how foresighted I am, I own globalwarmingrealestate.com, which will, of course, take advantage of the rising sea levels. Nice. So, Jamais, your guy can talk to Jerry and, you know, it's yeah. going to hire. We're in. I, I, we could turn that into an NFT and sell reef spots, yeah. like future you reef could spots. Sell, you could put that on, advertise that on Fox News and you would get so many investors. I already have a like front property on the Atlantic Ocean here in Chapel Hill, right? I'm ready. I'm exactly 80 feet above sea level. It's perfect. <laughs> but, but by the way, if you build a seaworthy home, you're good. You one that can convert into a boat? One, one, yeah, like, like, like houseboats. You go to Sausalito, there's a whole bunch of houseboats sitting in the water. They're really nice. They're well sighted. And, you know, sea level is going to rise and they're just going to move inland. Oh, we're almost back to seasteading here, guys. All right. So yeah. <laughs> nations in the open waters, you know? Okay. So, who would like to put a completely different topic in the conversation? I, I have we, we know nothing else? Yeah, Mika, know Mika go ahead. Yeah, so I mean, this came across my radar uh, in an in a curious way, and I'm wondering if anybody has a sense on this, which is a friend of mine struggling with her home COVID test said something like, I couldn't get the app to work. And I didn't dig into the details with her. I think it's OnGo, which is one of the home antigen tests, encourages you to you know, get their app and somehow sync the information from the test to the app. And, and this is on another list, the one that I put you on, Jerry, which you never participate in. And, um, I had and to, various I had... people. I had I to know. put it in a folder and I don't I know, go look because much, it, was, it was overwhelming me entirely. Yes. And, and various people were like, oh, you, you know, you can do the test without the app. But that, that sent me, you know, sort of looking briefly at what's currently going on with health tech. And, you know, I was just really impressed with how much home testing, home health monitoring seems to be blossoming um, and you know home urinalysis for everything from prenatal monitoring to you know seeing if you have signs of kidney disease you know to all these wearable kinds of sensors to being able to uh, basically do a video of your face and they'll be able to read your oxygen level from that you know so whether it's telehealth or, you know, just our kids are growing up totally comfortable with the idea that mom's going to stick something up your nose every now and then. <laughs> so I, I just wonder if, you know, there's some good news on the horizon on the health front um, as more of this stuff matures. I know there's a double-edged sword to it in that, you know, if you let them collect your data and aggregate it. They can both use that for good and for bad. 
it's like relatives who are being imprisoned because DNA people who did 23andMe are, are, are forming the missing link that turns DNA evidence into like, oh, it's this person. Well, that, is that a bad thing or a good thing, Jerry? I think socially it's probably pretty good. Yeah, and right. same thing with the rapid tests. I mean, the big problem now is you take a rapid test and whether you test positive or negative, you, you don't have to tell anyone and no one knows. So, so, you, so you think, okay, how about this little device? Like, you know, I picked these up at the library, uh, five pack, yeah. sitting in a bucket there. Um, but I take the test and, you know, I just look at it. So it, it should be like the Apple tile. It should be a little device, a little bit of built electronics, squirts the information out to the public health system if there is a public health system, which is a big question. That's when Robert De Niro swings in through your window and kidnaps you. <laughs> but there are, of course, the privacy issues and so well, on. Well, what so. they are doing, for example, is analyzing the sewage. Sure, yeah. Right, which, you know, is sort of inherently aggregated. <laughs> and guess what? Here they found in the sewage that Omicron was here in November. Yeah, Whoa. that's interesting. Can you imagine the, 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 the sewage archive so that they can go back in time and test what was there before? Like who maintains the sewage archive? Oh, it's like that... ice cores. Yeah, like no, ice cores it's much smellier, much smellier. Put me in charge of the ice cores any day, just not the sewage archive. That's great, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually had a personal interaction along these very lines recently. You may or may not notice I have this bandage under my eye. I had a one-sided knife fight with a dermatologist um, um, because I had a, you know, a uh, sebaceous hyperplasia that got bigger and miscolored if it comes through at all. But I took a picture of it. Ouch. That, um, yeah, that, that looks okay. like it's got to be removed. Well, right. But I, it was taking a picture of it and sending that to the dermatologist that actually made the difference. Right. That you know, I, describing it is describing it. Having the der der dermatologist look at that and say, yeah, that's a problem. And um, calling me in for the, you know, yeah. the, the, the biopsy came back clean uh, just last night, you know, fortunately. Cool. Oh, that's but, great. But the point is that we had the initial interaction electronically because I had high enough resolution camera on my phone yeah. right, to be able yeah. to send him useful information that allowed him to make an initial determination. Yeah. So the, the thing I thought would happen a lot more under pandemic was preventative health measures or detection through our smart devices, including your tone of voice. Like there's technology now that will detect, detect early onset Alzheimer's by a, a year or more, like by a good stretch, you can start, you can start to notice uh, essential tremor and a bunch of other stuff, just, just from your tone of voice, Never mind all the other info we have on skin tone and, and, yeah. and, and, and also behavioral stuff. Like when you start losing stuff or missing stuff or changing your habits, you can detect all sorts of stuff. Um, and I, I thought so much more of that would be at hand right now. And it doesn't seem to be, I'm kind of surprised by that. Yeah. So even, on a, even on a complete opt-in basis, I realize that it might sound like an invasion of privacy, but I would opt in to, if, if, if I knew that Google, because I've got a damn Pixel phone and I'm, I'm all in on Google, and if Google Health said, hey, Jerry, here's the, here's the terms, can we tell you if we notice anything that you should be worried about, I'd be like completely in. Well, maybe that's just a little bit further along, Jerry. I, what I'm struck by is that, you know, even the voluntary monitoring systems around, um, you know, COVID exposures uh, didn't get anywhere, at least here. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the vaccine passport thing hasn't died, right? Um, and that may yet come back. I remember when there was like a big rush of concern over it and then it went away and now maybe it's coming back, who knows? But I'm, I'm trying to see the, the plus side of this. Yeah, I've got the Excelsior on my phone too. Yeah, um, yeah, but the the degree to which the you know the technology and and the interactive tools are now in everybody's hands, um, and the the you know the idea that you know you might have your own little health lab on the kitchen table. Yeah, you will. Right? I wanted so much more of that than is actually present so far. So yeah. Hey, Bo. Good hey, to see Bo. you. Hey. 
Sorry, I was a little late. Deep dark winter, the... man. I just want to sleep like a bear. <laughs> I was going to say earlier, does anyone remember the, um, I think it was around SARS, that uh, airports were listening listening for people with productive coughs. Hmm. You know, basically had microphones set up to detect if somebody had a cough that was more than just a dry pack mm -hmm. um, and in order to zero in and isolate them. Um, and I'm wondering why we stopped doing that. You know, did it, I wonder if it not worked. It, it could also be that it didn't work, yeah. I mean, th there's systems to zero in on where a gunshot happened in dangerous neighborhoods where they put you know microphones up on, on towers and they triangulate where the sound came from to try to figure out where a shooting happened. Isn't that good news? Um, so th th there's lots of ways that tech can be helpful, even some of which are macabre sounding. The other thing I had was, the other question I had um, was for Jerry in particular, you mentioned that if Google said, hey, we think we have some you know, information about you that you'd like to know, would you feel just as uh, as um, welcoming to Facebook? Of course you not. If they could... well, what's the difference? I trust Cause... I trust I trust Google a like, like several orders of magnitude more than I trust Facebook, for sure, mm -hmm. without a doubt. Yeah, and I and I may be being naive about Google, but I still trust them. You know that much. Um, and you know your mileage may vary, and other people might have the opposite opinion. And 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 some people are busy running their own servers because they don't trust any of these entities. So there we are. Um, so health tech. Any, anybody else with feelings about health tech and where it is, or promises, or or whatnot? Nobody has strong feelings. I have strong feelings about being depressed about how we invest in the wrong things. I have strong feelings about being like, well, how are we going to monetize that, Jerry? Because that's the only thing that makes people interested. That's just right? the perfect delivery, too. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think we could be doing all kinds of cool things, but. Well, like the quantified self movement could create an opt in app separate from Apple or Google or whoever that says, hey, we've discovered a bunch of really cool stuff that you can that we can figure out together. And, and I'm surprised that um, patients like me and Cure Together sort of died off and we are, we're not doing more of that. I don't know what, I think one of them got bought and one of them went under. Um, so like, like, why are we not actually harnessing all of these capacities between sensors and statistics and everything else to make ourselves better? And without necessarily the venture capital incentives uh, that you just so beautifully put in front of us. Like, like we don't, that doesn't have to happen. Well, you know, the, the hack, the hacker spaces could meet quantified self could meet uh, social medicine could meet a couple other things. And we, we'd have all sorts of cool stuff to work with. Except it doesn't happen. But what it may happen is Facebook. Well, I don't think Facebook is the cause that it's not happening. No, but no, it's it's a symptom. It, I think it's you know it's it's a mushroom that sucks up all the energy from the mycelium. You know, people need jobs, and and you know, in in, ter in terms of monetization, driving things, uh, you, you know, it's like even scientific publishing now. They're yeah. they're offering you the option if you want to get peer reviewed more quickly and published more quickly, pay up. Yeah, What's exactly. Would, Everyone yeah. wants to win the, the Nobel Prize, right? They're all being driven by their noses. Yeah. This, but, is, uh, this is science. This is what Fauci is always talking about. So, so science for, is also driven by its nose. To, to pick a controversial subject, in the pandemic, we could have crowdsourced a whole bunch of trials or evidence gathering or other sorts of things. And some people would be more or less reliable in terms of what happened or what they did. I don't know how you'd figure that out. But but you know, we have a pandemic on, which has got global repercussions. Why haven't we been trying to like test stuff together? Uh, you're muted. I know. I was, <laughs> I was... <laughs> thank God. <laughs> uh, I and also I sang it just to because I was typing a message in the uh, in the chat because I have to jump again because I have a freaking 10 o'clock call. But uh, and it. what I sang was fear. 
right? Fear. Like we could have done all of these things, right? Like we we've, we've all been functioning at this sort of like fairly limited capacity as we've had to turn into sort of the sorters of information and the just the arbiters of who it is that is trustworthy and trying to right like I keep having to talk myself off the ledge of like, what, what did I, like, what was I doing for those two years? Like how, right. And, and looking at actually that I did a lot, there were a lot of things going on and we were functioning at sort of like the greatest possible capacity that we had. So it, it's more interesting to me to think about what we could do differently moving forward. Right. And like, we could have done, we could, None of this had to happen the way it happened, right? Like, <laughs> but if I go down that road, then I never stop screaming. So <laughs> I, I hear you. I feel you. Yeah. That is troubling. Kelly, thanks for being here. Sorry. You have call. You well. yep. Isn't that the quote later. for the, for the uh, period? If I go down <laughs> that road, I just start screaming. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. So what did I miss, Jerry? Did you specify this question about health um, tech and stuff like that? Well, health tech was a shift in topic. We were we were on a bunch of other things. We did a bunch of politics up front about the January 17th deadline and voting rights and filibusters and blue and red and politics behind the scenes. And then we then we like shifted at like quarter of uh, over toward health tech and what's up. And if you'd like to put something else, well, we in had the a conversation. detour into crypto. Don't forget. Crypto. Oh, that's right. Don't forget, we did NFTs. We totally fixed NFTs. Right, okay. Yeah. You can buy this recording, by the way, as an NFT. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was good, Mark. Hey, Mika, is there any chance the Build Back Better bill is going to get passed at all? Uh, I don't expect it to, honestly. I think it, at this point, we might get a few pieces passed, which would, which would not be terrible. Yeah. It depends, you know, who, and, and again, this is another case where it's a bottleneck. Everybody has heard that a big bill is going to pass, so they've jammed their thing in. And it's now a question of who gets, you know, who, who wins and who loses in that fight. Um, so we may get a few pieces, but we're not going to get the whole thing. I'm really sad about the um, child tax care credit because I mean we reduced child poverty by 25 percent. Is there a chance yeah. we're going to get saved? I mean that's it just seems to me like what started. Man, man, Manchin what's seems now? to be standing on that particular issue. Yeah, which is well, just he really hates weird poor people. He hates poor people. He thinks they're they're you know we're just coddling them and and well, uh, yeah. So so there's a whole there's a whole belief system that. People should pull themselves up by their bootstraps. People who are poor are there through their own doing. Uh, people should be personally responsible. It has a lot to do with responsibility is one of the big trigger words here. Um, and, it's, and it's an interesting train of thought. And I'm like, I've been thinking for a long time, how do you interrupt that train of thought with some other ideas? And so there's some really good TEDx talks out there about poverty is not poor people's fault and a bunch of other stuff. It's super yeah. cool, but it's not working. Remember the universal basic income? For yeah. sure. So one question you might ask is, what happened to that? Because that's what the child tax credit is. Well, you know, that's, UBI's been happening for 30 years at least. So, and it's slowly gaining more and more uptake. It, I think it so was it, gaining It's a more. winner. I think it's gonna win. I, I think it was gaining more, but the, the, the political failure right now, the reason why the child tax credit is gonna go away is because the polling doesn't support it. And our politicians are all driven by polls. So if they saw that it was really, really popular, they'd fight harder to keep it. It's, but the universal health care polls really high with both Republicans and Democrats. But there's a, and the, where is it? Well, that's one where you have a, a very, very powerful oppositions. And they're really, really good at converting support, hypothetical support for universal health care into fear of losing access to your own doctor. So there's a great, they've, they've gotten really good at blurring the picture. Right, so, so this is just an example of what the Princeton oligarchy study found, right. that the interest groups and the power 
right. decides 100% or 99% what legislation gets passed and what gets enforced. Right. Yes, we yeah. have the best democracy money can buy. We, we have one party that's really clear about that and the other one which is conflicted. Um, but both parties are two heads yeah. of that same oligarchy. Ult ultimately, are, yeah. True, true. Until we get more politicians who get elected with only small donations. And the problem is, is that the people who are really good at getting small donations right now are the most extreme. So you get the AOCs and the Rand Pauls. You know, the thing about that child tax care credit is, first of all, it's um, it's really it's implementing Milton Friedman's idea of negative income tax. Yeah, yeah. But the other thing was, well, the thing was most really was that made it different than just doing that was it was guaranteeing um, equality of opportunity for poor kids. Come right. on, America, that's I, what I, it was about. Uh, so all I can say is I agree, but uh, it's not an organized constituency. Why did we get further on on um, stopping evictions? Oh. Is because you've got a lot of people who have been organizing tenants for a really long time. So it wasn't just this. It's the com It's the right thing to do. It doesn't just happen because it's the right thing to do. It's also because you have people who are, have organized to elevate and defend that position. And so we're, we may get yet another moratorium on evictions. I mean, the last one, it was really hard. You know, it took Cori Bush basically going outside Congress, you know, out to the steps and basically saying, I'm going to sit here. And she got other members of Congress to join her to shame the Democrats. So we're up to Nancy Pelosi, who has a beautiful mansion somewhere in Napa Valley. You know, the, this whole eviction thing, would we would, they would have already let it lapse. But it's about who's organized. So when you say, you know, poor, absolutely poor families benefit, but who organizes them? Okay. That, okay. That's, that's the problem. And okay. when, and when O'Keefe killed Acorn, I mean, Acorn was one of the few groups that had built its entire organizing strategy around uh, uh, poor families basically. So, you know, it's, it's an interest group issue, it seems to me. Why don't we have universal health care? I, I, this may surprise you, Mark, but in New York, we have a very strong movement for universal at the state level. And one of the biggest interest groups, other than the hospitals and so on, uh, that are against it, are the big unions. You know why? Because they administer health insurance for their members, and it, it's a key source of uh, you know, justification for being in the union. And, and they don't want to look like, that. And, and so like the AARP is just a big insurance company, roughly. Like, like these things are really stupid, but, but you know, a major source of income for them. It's like a lot of, a lot of funny associations used to um, sell long distance plans and they made their money from being like your long distance provider. And that, that was like a, a gravy train for them until long distance got killed by, by technology. Right. Hey, Jerry, when are we um, going to see your new place, by the way? I want to see video of your new place. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's cool. So um, I don't think everybody knows. Uh, two months ago, we had no plans on moving, but April was sort of like, uh, we were, we've been in a small place since 2015, a 740-foot um, studio flat, which is very nice, uh, quite small, uh, which we purchased originally when we were living in San Francisco with no intent of moving to Portland as an investment property. And then we switched our plan in 2015, like over the course of two or three months, we just said, oops, no, let's move to Portland. And we love it here. So we're, we're settled here. Then um, April's book published August 24th. Uh, and then April contacted somebody and got a referral to a real estate agent who said, do you know that there's a unit available in your building you might like? And we're like, well, no. And it, it had been on the market since August, so which, which maybe explains why April wasn't looking. I haven't been looking around. And so, um, uh, and so we went and looked at it and we're like, this is really nice. Uh, and it's, it's like more than- the top of the building, by the way. Isn't that it's, great? It's, it's, it's more than twice the square footage, not more than twice the cost, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we made a low offer, which was accepted right away. Wow. Um, and that? Yeah, and got the- you know, got the loan, got the everything. It's all, it's all kind of done. So we're now a, a week or two into a new place with boxes everywhere. But but the, the stuff that needs to work, like 
where you do the Zoom calls and where I cook. Uh, and, and all that are, are, are nice and settled at this point. So, so it's kind of cool. And, uh, and yeah, and this, this place actually has maybe room to entertain, Bo. Yay. That's great. Yay. I know. Because Bo and Christy look are, amazing. I just, it looks light filled and air, oh, it just looks beautiful. It's a beautiful place. And I think the people who had it before us own a flooring place in Vancouver, Washington, just across the river. And so the floors on the lower level are this beautiful hardwood color that's just warm and like you just want to kind of cozy up to the floor, strangely. Um, anyway, so lots of nice things about it. Okay, I want to, can I ask Mika another political question? Yeah, but then I'm uh, going to ask you a market question. Okay. okay. Excellent. Good, 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 good. So pretty, pretty much the only kind of following the politics I do, you know, just casually listen to NPR or the PBS News Hour. And they indicated, their analysts, who I really like, indicated that, um, you know, Mannequin was always, Mannequin, what's his name, Mannequin, whatever his name is, is always going to be a problem. But it just seemed like this, they loaded Build Back Better with everything but the kitchen sink. And it, and it seemed to demonstrate this tension within, within the party between the super, you know, uh, AOCs and the super, yeah. it just seems like the big tent thing kind of crashed this bill with all their dreams being stuffed into this bill. What's going on, Mika? Well, you're, you're not completely wrong. You have a generation's worth of deferred priorities packed into that thing. And, you know, the working theory, I guess, was, you know, uh, Democrats get to make big leaps forward socially, uh, you know, once a generation, let's seize it. Um, you know, we have gaping holes everywhere in terms of our infrastructure, our social infrastructure. Um, it's hard to deny all those things. Yeah. And the, the argument that the, the liberal left would make back is we started at six trillion and Manchin initially agreed to 3.5. Right. So now we've whittled it down to less than two. Um, you know, is this a good faith negotiation or what? Uh, the other thing, which I think you've got to remember, Bo, is it's 1.9 trillion over 10 years. Oh, the markets are all talking about that. This isn't That's, even really, this is not a not real- Not that trade. much money. No, and I mean, they, in December, they voted to give the Pentagon more money than it requested and at a pace that would give them something like eight or nine trillion over 10 years. And nobody's Jesus, really? Doing it. Yeah. The yeah. Pentagon budget is like almost eight hundred billion. That's crazy. Right? Uh, well, actually, so, def the defense budget yeah. is is the DOE is, is DOD budget, right. is the nuclear part of the DOE budget, it's the Veterans Administration, and it's some other health. It's 1.2 trillion per year. Yeah. Jesus. You know, and when, when it comes to funding wars, you know, they they we go off on them without even knowing how we're going to fund them. Right. Um, so, you know, the best thing that Biden did on this front was get us out of Afghanistan, because now we're at least we're not burning three hundred million dollars a day on that. Right. But and a, a lot of and a lot of the but also a lot of the war <laughs> funding was I don't know how they did this, but a lot of the war funding was taken off the books, was was oh, buried in yeah. other places. Yeah. Or or yes, they would they would. Uh, Basically, they have something called the Pago rule, where you know if you're going to spend, you have to show you. It, you didn't have to do that for for the military. So hmm. my question for you, Bo, is um, Federal Reserve signals seem to be that they're going to hit the brakes. Is this already been factored into people's thinking, uh, yeah. or or what? What do what do we think about inflation? I'm I'm curious what your perspective is. That's, I'm the perfect person to ask these questions to. <laughs> uh -huh. I was uh, betting on inflation over a year ago because of M2 yeah. growth and everything. And what's very different about this period of time versus 08 is in 08, all the money that the Fed printed went straight to bank balance sheets and the banks didn't loan anybody any money. So it essentially filled a black hole, a, a financial black hole, but it never hit the real economy. This time around, when they put money directly in people's bank accounts, this was a whole different ball of wax. And by the way, I applaud this ball of wax because it's how we stopped having the depression. It was, it was, this was, this is what they should have done in the depression, and they didn't. And this time, it, so it worked. So, is inflation coming? Yes, inflation's coming. 
Um, it's not like stagflation. It's not crazy 70s kind of inflation happening because there are bottlenecks. There are all kinds of things going on. So the Fed, a lot of what the Fed doing is psychology. They are scaring the hell out of the markets because inflation psychology is a scary thing. Once everybody starts, this is how it can get kind of 70s like. So the Fed is scaring the hell out of the markets. The markets are is rotating out of growth stocks, rotating out of anything that, that earnings aren't solid are going to be there. And, and growth stocks, their earnings are way out in the future. And it, interest rates go up, go up, those earnings worth less. So anyways, so the Fed is scaring the shit out of the markets. Um, but uh, the real smart people also know what the Fed is trying to do is to break the psychology of inflation. Um, the, the thing that's limiting the Fed is that the Fed can't just do a Volcker and jack interest rates up to five, six percent because right. the Fed has the, the government has so much debt that it would literally sink the federal government. So what like we are call. in the smart people who are looking at history and the history this looks like is the 1940s and it, it was called financial repression. So the Fed wants to scare inflation, but they can't raise interest rates too high and inflation will probably run higher than interest rates for probably through this entire decade, Mika. If you well, actually, we had price controls in the 40s, didn't we? Yeah, we had all kinds of stuff. And essentially in the 40s, they managed to get rich people to pay for the war, not only through higher taxes, but through inflation eating away at their money because you only were getting like, you know, 3% on your bonds, but the inflation was up to 10%. Fine. So this is how governments get out of big debt because there's there's two ways to get out of big debt. Pollsters and say, hey, everybody, let's raise taxes and pay that debt off. Guess who goes for that? Nobody. No pollster never wants to do that. Or the other way is inflate the debt away and hold interest. Right. So a little inflation isn't, a, isn't a, a bad thing at all. I get Absolutely. that. Absolutely. The fact that there's inflation, Mika, indicates that the economy is growing. If we didn't have any inflation, frankly, the market, I'm kind of weird. It's kind of freaky how people are freaking out and making an issue out of this. Inflation is indicating the economy is running hot. Thank God. Right. Is that, if that's what you want. Did I answer your question, Mika, or do you want me yeah, to? Yeah, that does answer my question. Thank you. Okay. Um, I've got a question for the gentleman in the sweatshirt. Um, so isn't inflation to be expected because minimum wages have finally, after an incredibly long time, been bouncing up? A lot of stores are raising the minimum wage for lots of different positions. People in pandemic, are, are, there's the great resignation afoot and, or the great quit or whatever you want to call it, the big quit. Like people are reconsidering, do I want to go back to that shitty job that, that, that well, like retail stores long ago stopped hiring people for more than 30 hours a week because then, then they're your employees, you got to pay benefits. So everybody's part-time adjunct faculty at schools. Nobody's getting the benefits of actual employment or a reasonable wage. And isn't there a huge reshuffling of that God willing to better paid jobs? Although I'm not sure those are, those are necessarily showing up or opening up. And wouldn't that naturally lead to some inflation that we should manage by saying, yes, this process is going to bump things around and we're gonna settle just fine, don't worry about it. As opposed to don't look over in the corner, this inflation thing's gonna go away. We're gonna scare you off it, which seems stupid to me. Yeah, in fact, the, the, the very smart people I read are just saying, Hey, look, finally, the workers are getting something. Thank God, because we don't want society to fall apart. And yes, absolutely. Yes, it's going to hurt capital. Yes, it's going to hurt corporate profit margins, which are an all time like 70 year high, by the way. They're crazy. So, and the 1% has done just fine in the last period here. Oh, yeah. And, uh, so, yes, uh, to, yes to everything you're saying. And the kind of the problem that's happening right now is poor people are getting more money. The unskilled, non college educated workers are finally, after 50 years, getting something thank god and they're the two-thirds of america that are voting very well, extreme in so, 1974 was the big disjunct basically right. uh that that's the last time that anybody's wages were matching like the cost of living and suddenly productivity kept going up but wages stayed the same or went down relative and, and just down 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 it is inflationary and right now we're having a little problem because inflation is actually leaping past what those people getting increases in pay so right, right now the first day we're getting a hell of a little bit, and, and I was saying yay, and then um, now they're actually inflation's kind of hurting them a little bit. Uh, they're yeah. not now; they're only they're just barely. So yeah, that's that story is evolving, and I think that that's going to also be the whole next decade. I think that that's going to. But I'd love, but I'd love for the Democrats to pick up and say, hey, there's like a. We're, we're adjusting to be more human because people were making way too little and and like that means there's going to be bumps and groans and and you know here's here's our strategy to address that story but the storyline of don't look over here nothing going on um is stupid 
Yeah, I agree. I don't, I don't understand it. It seems like a really bad strategy. And, and like Biden has to do a whole bunch of things. For some reason, uh, public opinion, including Democrats, of his job has fallen, his polls are way down. Uh, the economy is like booming in, in, on lots of measures, but everybody thinks the economy is in the shitter. There's a whole bunch of weird things going on that he needs to spend some effort turning around. Yeah, they're, they're really battering him with this inflation thing, which- again, But that's great. They're doing a good job of that. that the economy is, is, on, is growing. Which right. two years ago it could the have been polls, a full blown depression. I, yeah, but I, I think the polling is mostly related to exhaustion with COVID and and the 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 squeeze that so many people are experiencing about that. They thought mm -hmm. it was gonna be over. And you know, I do think the, the Biden team uh really did kind of declare victory too soon. And they dropped the ball in a number of places. And now, you know, people are like, when is this ever going to be over? Um, so that's that's his problem now. It's really unfortunate. You you can't say, well, I inherited a mess. You know, they didn't have a plan for distributing vaccines when I came in. You know, we had to solve the most immediate problems. We got you all vaccines. Some of you decided not to take them. I, I mean, personally, I've wanted Biden to attack the Republicans for being in favor of, of the virus. You know, why are they on the side of the virus? But I don't know, you know, they're why they don't do that. Uh, I guess it, it somebody's convinced them that uh, that would just depress the, the number of people getting vaccinated more. But yeah, the, it's, it's bleak. It does feel somewhat bleak, doesn't it? The one piece of good news is that- uh, at, at least there's one. On the gerrymandering front, it does look like um, the initial predictions that you know the Republicans were just going to absolutely, you know, take advantage of this process to you know get themselves more seats. That they've mainly been using gerrymandering to protect their own incumbents. Hmm. So the net effect seems to be a wash. Still. If I were to bet on the House next year, I, I still think the Democrats will lose it, but it is not as far out of reach to hold it as as people thought six and months ago. I, I, sort of along those lines, if either Manchin or Cinema decide to switch parties, then all bets are off, big shit happens. And I have to imagine yeah. that both of them are under insane pressure and that there's like a little pot of gold being held out in front of them by the Republicans. Like yeah. really, you want to lure them away from the Democratic Party now, yeah. right? Like, sure. like right well, now, because, what... because if you do that right now, that the, the, the leadership changes, what gets what gets put in front of the whole, you know, the yeah. chambers changes, like Why everything some of us changes. Wish that Stephen Breyer would resign today. Bingo. <laughs> Bingo. I was trying for good news, Jerry. Oh, sorry. You, you know what? You made a noble effort, but this is not the era of good news, Mika. You no, know, both Manson and Cinema know that if they switched over to the Republican Party, they'd be just another face in the crowd. Right well, now, they have everybody catering to them. Yeah, um, Manchin is the chair of uh, the Energy Committee, too, right? So McConnell would have to promise him something like that. Which is totally doable. I mean, okay. that's what that's what these deals look like. It's like, hey, I'll give you these committee assignments. You, you get- Can I like, just say, it's because it's so obvious that, you know, whoever wrote this timeline was very lazy, that they named the, uh, the you know, the multimillionaire uh, opponent of all things good, Mansion. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they could have named him Scrooge McDuck. <laughs> that would yeah, be, yeah. But Jimmy, that that would just be too obvious. Yeah, true. A bit too on the nose. Uh, um, a lot of com uh, easy to A say. lot of debate and and controversy, but mostly online around the um, refusal of the House to push forward on a bill to uh, outlaw, you know, to, to remove the ability of legislators to engage in the stock market trades. Oh, yeah, I just saw a thing this morning. Yeah. And do either of you, Mika or, or Christy, um, <laughs> oh, that's what you're, that's what you're doing. Uh, Mika or Bo, do I, either of you have a sense of whether that is even a realistic idea or 
or is it oh, just Nancy Pelosi, populist name, you know, name Pelosi, calling? Pelosi is against it, so the, the Democrats will not move that issue. Her it's husband, terrible. her husband is seen on yeah. the stock market. Her husband is yes, yeah, no, she's gotten very rich over the last decade or so. She was rich before, but now really rich. Um, yeah. I, this one, yeah, I agree. I, I think this is this is one of those issues where, you know, in in less crazy times, you could see the Bernie Sanders, you know, the the right left attacking the middle on something like this. It it has happened. Um, you know, that's how we got more transparency for the Federal Reserve, for example. Um, no, you're totally right. It, it, isn't there a stock fund that is actually uh, based on uh, watching Pelosi's disclosures? That would be very smart. I should go find out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because that exactly. guy is legendary. Mr. Pelosi. I'll buy, the, I'll buy that ETF. <laughs> <laughs> and don't forget the Federal Reserve. I mean, they're, they, they up the standards, but not very far. They can still trade. It really oh. is shocking what we let our politicians and central bankers do they're all very rich people yeah but wow it's just pretty shocking what we are letting them get away with mm -hmm. yeah i agree it almost makes you want to get a pitchfork or put on some camo and and you know head down to the capital right let's let's call nick canower and see if this we can't get a crowd together Mika. come on man <laughs> don't get us in trouble testing testing one two yeah 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 no it's maddening so anybody have like a puppy or a kid who watched uh, who I'm, I'm curious jamay's view of don't look up oh man um painful painful uh, all my friends who work in the in the climate world expressed uh, a tremendous pain about you know, some of them couldn't watch it. They'd start watching and then they stop. But it is one of the most watched movies ever on Netflix. Mm -hmm. What movie? And it's globally, you know, it's been, uh, don't look up. Oh, okay. And, it, you know, it's been in the top 10 in something like 90 countries over the last few weeks. Yeah. Well, they, you know, they have monster. DiCaprio and, and Lawrence on, in it. So it's definitely going to grab people just for the casting. But, but it's um, reaching beyond the the usual suspects is, is right. my point. And right. what I picked up anecdotally is um, because the politics of the movie are confused, <laughs> uh, which is to say, it's not clear that the president is just a Trumpy. You know, she has a picture of herself hugging Bill Clinton on, on her desk in the Oval Office, that it, it, is, it is reaching people who voted for Trump who then want to talk about, well, what are we going to do about climate change? Well, Which, yay. Like, good yay. job, Hollywood, for a change. Yay. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. But, Jamey, you didn't watch it or you just hated it? Oh, no, I didn't hate it. Um, I just found it painful. Painful it is. Yeah. Because it's, you know, I wrote a, I wrote a piece for a bulletin in the Atomic Scientist last year that was all about how science fiction people, just, you know, writers had not, of all the things they, they, would write about in terms of apocalypse with the one thing they didn't write about was people just simply not believing it was happening even mm. though it was you know, obvious all around them and so it felt like i mean i know the movie started production well before my article came out in the bulletin but it felt like they had a similar I mean, on a similar wavelength of just oh yeah why um, so it just painful. tom tomorrow actually did a cartoon uh with this very premise years ago. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'll find it if I can. But uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I enjoyed it, but you know. George Monbiot wrote a good column about it, basically saying, I saw my whole life flash before my eyes, that, that he's the one who was crying on BBC because everybody wasn't taking the topic seriously. Uh -huh. um, and and he was like, uh, I have lived this. This is this is my my experience of trying yeah. to, you know, wake us all up on a, on this important topic. It's nice to see a. Uh, it's nice to get representation in the, in the media about people, those of us who pound our heads against the wall. Mm. Yeah, I feel seen. 
Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, on that note, <laughs> we just we'll just invite our families in for our last dinner as the Earth uh, is destroyed. I will point out that the Musk Zuckerberg character is the only survivor. <laughs> I don't think he really lasts very long, though. Judging by the, how do you know? He looks the same, and he's there, like, and he's like, "Oh, I think that's a flesoceropod," <laughs> because his prediction comes true. I mean, right. I think his algorithms are busy creating enough enough Plan B, C, D, E's for him that he survives kind of anything. They land there totally naked. Which is fine, state of nature, uh, whatever. Fine just for the animals. <laughs> just don't go talk to the animals. Yes, he, whatever, he does say something do. like, "Well, don't talk to the brontocards or whatever." <laughs> but they're all exactly. encroaching, and none of those people look like they have any defenses. So yeah, I, yeah. I don't think it ends well. <laughs> or it um, ends great. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Eat the rich, as it were. Eat yes. the rich. Um, so the one, another bright spot, or maybe the only so far. Oh, good. Yes. James yes. Webb Telescope. Yes. Yes. Okay, that's right. Oh, God. You're right. <laughs> Completely perfect. Um, not just perfect, but better than perfect unfolding because they actually saved um, fuel. Cool. Right. So they're actually going to run longer. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. It's I a beautiful that. object, too. This next decade, Jamais, they will. Or is the likelihood of we're going to find that there's other life that's likely going to be now, right? It's coming up. Well, if, we're, if we were going to, it's going to be pretty soon. Um, I'm, I'm increasingly convinced that uh, we're, in, we're living in a test simulation of how would Earth develop without any contact from outside uh, civilizations. <laughs> Who would want to have contact with us, man? <laughs> well, on, on that subject, I want to recommend the book, The Anomaly. Hmm which was a bestseller in France last year and has just been translated into English. Uh, and I read it over vacation and it's uh, a lot of good fun. And the, the core question that it wrestles with is, are we all living in a simulation? I will not give anything further away. I will look for it. Wow. Yeah. Good. All right. Published in 2014. Science no, fiction. No, 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 by Hervé de Tellier. It came out in 2020. Oh, I've got the wrong one. The anomaly. Well, let's just hope some parts of the build back better that they get a couple of them done. Um, like Thank you. I'm, I am now I am now corrected. The anomaly novel 2000, 2020, every okay. lift to the egg. Thank you. Alrighty, folks. All right. Yeah. Well, Thank you. Stay alive. Well. See you next time. All right. Good idea. Don't get eaten by the ichthyosaurus. <laughs>